Welcome to the Charlevoix Stories Project, a continuation of Charlevoix oral tradition. Today is Thursday, September 15th. My name is David L. Miles. I am with the Charlevoix Historical Society, and I am in the Charlevoix Public Library. We are going to be talking to Linda Mueller, who is the owner of Castle Farms here in Charlevoix. So welcome to Linda. Tell me a little bit about your own background, where you were from, where you grew up, how, where you got your education, how you met your husband Richard, and his background in Charlevoix. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was born in the thumb of Michigan, actually. My dad was selling um, uh, milking machines, and we lived in um, a little house next to my grandma and grandpa Shaw, my mother's family. And then um, my dad got tired of getting kicked by cows, <laughs> and so he decided he would go back to college on the uh, GI Bill. So we moved to um, Willow Run, and he went to school during the day, and then he worked at night. Um, and uh, he worked at a chemical plant where he could do his studying at night, and just check the valves every once in a while. So I don't know how he managed <laughs> to go to school and work and have a family. Did he go to school at Eastern Michigan? He went to University of Michigan, actually. Oh, he lived in Ypsilanti. He then. did. Uh, that's where, they didn't have married student apartments, so that's where all the married students lived mm -hmm. in the government housing. Anyway, so then he took a job with Cleveland Trust and we moved to Ohio and we moved to Lakewood, and that's where my husband, Richard, his family lived in Lakewood as well. But we didn't meet till high school, and so um, it was a very big high school. There were 800 in our class, and I didn't come across him till we were seniors, and we were in a speech class together. I was really shy and uh, didn't talk much, and so my parents thought speech class would be good for me. Boy, was it. It got me a husband. <laughs> but that wasn't their intention. <laughs> so, so we started dating, and he took me to the senior prom, and we've just been steady ever since. <laughs> well, good. So that was 1966. And you got married when? 69. Okay. Oh, we, what is Richard's connection to Domino Pizza? He started, well, he went to the University of Michigan as well, and he started delivering pizzas when he was a freshman. Uh, he had a friend who was working there, and he wanted a night off, so he got Richard to fill in, and he liked it, so he took a job with Domino's, and then... Um, we were married in 1969. I had come up uh, to Charlevoix with his family. They invited me um, after our senior year, so that would have been 1967. Mm -hmm. And I got to spend a week in Charlevoix, and I thought, oh, this is a nice family. How do you get in it? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so then he went to the University of Michigan, and I went to Kent State. and. Then we were engaged that next summer. Um, we were 19 years old and I couldn't wait forever, so <laughs> I proposed and he accepted. <laughs> it was kind of like, why don't we get married? Oh, okay. <laughs> we were so young, what did we know? <laughs> so he joined Domino Pizza through his association with- University uh, of Michigan. And, and Tom Monahan. And at that time, I believe it was Tom Monahan's first store. It was over by the uh, the Law Quad. Well, his first store, I believe, was at Eastern Michigan. Oh, was it? Well, he had one store in Bay City, I believe, with his brother, and mm. then it was going bankrupt. So his brother took the Volkswagen, and Tom got the store. <laughs> but he managed to turn it around and get it to make money, and he had a store at Eastern Michigan. But by the time we came in, uh, that would have been 1967 when Richard started, there were maybe 20 stores. Oh, by that time. And there was okay. one at um, University of Michigan. 
And he worked his way up through the ranks? And he did. He started as a driver, and then they taught him how to make pizzas. And then he worked with some, uh, he became friends with, well, they were all friends because they worked at night, and then when they got off work, then they'd all go out and eat. Uh -huh. <laughs> After do dealing with pizza all day, they had to go get something to eat. So, <laughs> so one of his friends owned the store at um, the Broadway store over by North Campus, and he taught Richard how to run the store. So he wasn't really the assistant manager, he was just the guy who ran the store on the manager's day off. <laughs> and so then um, we were married in 1969 and I moved up to Ann Arbor and we were living in married student apartments at the time, both going to school. Mm -hmm. And he was working nights and so Let's see, it would have been 1970, the opportunity came up to buy half interest in a store um, in Ypsilanti that had only 2,000 addresses. It was a tiny little store, but we took all of our life savings <laughs> and we borrowed some money from his parents and plunked down $4,000 for part of the store. And uh, Richard did real well. And now you have how many stores? I still have a part of Franchise Down South. We had, at one point we had 350 stores and then we sold off New York, Chicago, and Detroit mm -hmm. and just focused on um, Mississippi and Louisiana. I see. And then Richard retired a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> but the last time that he retired, he wanted to do another uh, food-related business, and Domino's required him to sell his uh, stock in RPM Pizza. Uh -huh. So I got the stock. So I have the house, the castle, <laughs> the pizza store. <laughs> good thing we're such good friends. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, so I think they have 135 stores um, in Mississippi, Louisiana, and Indianapolis. Okay. Now, with that under your feet, you went on to the big topic of Charlevoix, of course, which is Castle Farms. Uh, by the way, I want to interject <coughs> in here that Richard's association with Charlevoix dates back to the 1880s. Way back, yes. Um, His great-grandfather was one of the founders of the Belvedere, of the Belvedere Club. Club. Right, Oscar right. Allen. So he's, his roots are very deep here. They are. So speaking for yourself, when did you become interested in castles? When did they start intriguing you? Well, when I was in elementary school, I would take the bus over to the Cleveland Museum of Art and take art classes on Saturday. And they had this big room that had armor in it, and they had uh, armor for men, and they had armor on horses, and of course, I just thought armor was just the coolest thing. And I also went to um, a Lutheran church in, in uh, Lakewood that was stone and it had gothic windows and stained glass and pillars and I just loved that stone architecture. I just felt so good there. So it wasn't a big leap okay. <laughs> from knights and armor and, and gothic architecture to castles. And then you began going to Europe and experiencing the real things and becoming even more intrigued. We did. We went, um, we went to Germany one summer with his dad and we traveled around Germany. That's where his family was from. And the first castle that I saw, it wasn't even a, a historic castle, it was Neuschwanstein. Uh, uh, Mad Ludwig's castle, mm -hmm. and it was built in the 1800s. It had never been a fortified castle, but it was just amazing. Yes, I've been there myself. It was built on the top of this mountain. Oh, of course, it looks like it's really old, but it was built with modern materials. It had I-beams, and it had 
concrete and but it was just oh, this is just the coolest thing <laughs> it almost bankrupted the bavarian economy it did i think that's what got uh, ludwig put in the insane asylum <laughs> but if they had known what a tourist industry it was going to um, create they probably would have uh, made him a hero <laughs> <laughs> and that became the model for uh, Walt Disney's it castles did. in Florida and it California. Did. Right. Ludwig, you know, he was ahead of his time. He even had a water ride where you could ride in a boat through a cave that, I mean, Disney, give me a break. <laughs> Maybe they got their idea from him again. And that was inspired by the opera Lohengrin with the swing. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. yes. So he and Walt would have really made a team, <laughs> wouldn't they? <laughs> so now we come up to the time when you are driving by Charlevoix and you see a castle. So tell us what happened. Well, we did. When we drove up from Cleveland, we would come up M66 to come into Charlevoix. And here's this really neat place over on the right-hand side of the road. And at the time, it was Castle Van Haver. So on one of our days when we were out driving around in his um, Volkswagen bus, <laughs> we decided we would go see the castle and go in and walk around it. And I was walking around inside one of the buildings, and they had these trenches and troughs, and I thought, this looks like a cow barn. And then I found out later that it actually had been a cow barn. What was, what was the condition of the building at the time? Um, well, it didn't have the roof. The roof was gone, and it was just, this was the um, main cow barn. Um, it had all been cleaned up after the roof had collapsed and they took it out. So it was clean and they had sculpture up and some uh, displays where you could read about different things. And it was, it was neat and clean, but not, not usable. <laughs> so what, um, what was the catalyst for buying the place? Well, we were up, um, in the summer of 1999, I believe it was, and my our rival had died, and the girls had put up the castle for sale. And my oldest son had been out um, shopping downtown. His wife was shopping. He was looking in the windows <laughs> of the real estate office, and he came home and he said, "Mom, the castle's for sale." Wouldn't it be fun? We'll call him up and tell him we're interested, and then we can go through all the buildings and see stuff that we never got to see before. <laughs> so we did. <laughs> Actually, he took, um, his wife took some film of it. We have film of us walking through the buildings. And what I really, when I saw the leaves that had blown in the building, I just wanted to take a broom and sweep them out and <laughs> clean it up. And Richard teases me that it would have been cheaper just to get me a broom <laughs> and just sweep that one doorway out. But, um, so then we didn't go any farther after that, and we didn't pursue it any farther. But the next October, his mother was living um, up here, and she said, the castle's up for auction. So we thought, oh, auction. Hmm. <laughs> so Richard and his brother Glenn and my brother Tom, who all worked together at Domino's, they knew real estate. So they called up a real estate um, a lawyer. They found one in Travers. And they said, can you go out to Charlevoix and do a quick title search? Because... Um, you need to do that before you buy something. And could you bid for us, please? And by the way, it's tomorrow. <laughs> but you're going to be at the courthouse already, so how hard could this be? <laughs> so <laughs> he, the, the, the real estate lawyer tells a really funny story. <laughs> he had never come across people like this before. <clears throat> so he made them sign something that 
if anything showed up in the title search afterwards, we wouldn't sue him because he only had half a day to do it. And we wired him $350,000 <laughs> to this man we didn't know. <laughs> and he came to Charlevoix and uh, did the title search. He said it looks pretty clean. And then he was there for the auction. And there were only two people. One was the man who had a lien on the property, and the other one was our lawyer. So Richard said, you know, don't go back and forth. Just jump straight to the 350000 That'll just blow it out of the water, and, <laughs> and we'll be done with it. And that was just how it worked out. All of a sudden, you had a castle. I did. Well, kind of. <laughs> well, the next thing I knew, I got a lawsuit in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I'm in business now. Then <laughs> the girls, having been Art's daughters, uh, thought that the first thing you should do would be to sue somebody. <laughs> that um, they wanted to make sure that the money from the sale paid off all the debts so that anything left over would be free and clear. Let's backtrack a little bit here for our viewers, just for a second. Um, Art Rival, you were referring to owned castle farms. Which, be, which before was Castle Van Haver, which before was Loeb Farms. And so um, that was the big rock and roll venue for about 20 years. Yeah. And then it stopped, and then he died, and then his heirs put it up for sale. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and before that, it was originated by Albert Loeb, who was the vice president of the Sears Roebuck Company. He was. He was became, also the acting president during World War I. True. When, um, when the president would, had been called off to Washington on war work. And then it, uh, the, the farm portion of the estate then came into the hands of John Haver, Van Haver, who it did. owned it when Yusufer saw it. He had worked in um, East Jordan. And when he drove back and forth, he just loved that property. He was, a, he was into metalworking. Right. And so he talked to the Loeb um, sons, I think um, Alan and Ernest and Tommy, mm -hmm. and he bought, the, he bought, I believe, 100 acres and uh, the farm. So then after And you, the manager's and, house, I believe. So then after you obtained it, the first step, I believe, was getting rid of the stage for, that had been the venue for the rock and roll concerts, and then you started in on preservation. What was the first step that you had to take? Did you had to find a contractor or contractors who were specialists in historic preservation, or was this a learn-as-you-go process? Oh, it's the way we always do things. <laughs> it's learn-as-you-go. How hard could this be? <laughs> so, um, well, the first step was to clear all the junk out of the building. So we spent the whole summer carting off um, trash, and there was a whole collection of water heaters in there. I don't know. Art never threw things away, I guess. He just stored them. And then when we cleared this place out, we discovered it's very expensive to have all this hauled away. No wonder he just left it in there. So I think we had three big dump trucks of, um, of metal and uh, trash and things hauled off. And so, well, so then after we cleared out the buildings, we had been looking around and uh, talked to historic preservation people and uh, we needed an architect. So one of our friends, had an architect down in Detroit, so we thought, oh, we'll go with him. And so he had worked with Larry Sean in laser construction out of Petoskey. So, okay, then he'll be good. <laughs> I, you would think that we would put a lot of um, research into this, but no. <laughs> Just it, it, God sends us people. You know, we need somebody, and somebody shows up, and they turn out to be really good, and they point us to somebody else. Larry had worked with Tony Pearsall in town here, Pearsall Construction, and this group of 20-year-old guys 
and they had never done anything like this before in their life, but they were really good. The, he, Tony looked at what was there and tried to match the construction that he did with 1918 construction, which is not the way you're trained at all anymore. He was good for the project. <laughs> I think if I remember right, you got started around 2001? We did. Uh, we uh, negotiated with uh, the rival girls and came up with a um, mutually agreeable price. Um, so I actually got the title in January, January 4th of 2001. Okay. And we also had engineers come out to look at the, the horse barn. It still had a roof, but it was sagging and it had kind of shifted off, off level. And some of the engineers said they wouldn't go in the building on a windy day. <laughs> I oh. thought, you baby. Oh. <laughs> I didn't say it. But uh, Glenn actually had found the Michigan P Barn Preservation Society. That's Richard's brother. Mm -hmm. And they were meeting in March in East Lansing. <laughs> <laughs> See, all the timing just seemed to fall in place. Uh -huh. So I went, and they were all excited that I had the low barns, and one of their construction people had um, restored over 500 barns. And he said, oh, sure, I can fix that. So we got him to come up, and he put... Um, jacks on, on the floor every so many feet to jack up the part that was sagging. And then he put chains and winches to the ceiling and every day or every so often he would turn it a click and he'd turn the, the uh, jacks a click and it would slowly get it back to where it should be. Well, literally raising the roof. Yes. <laughs> if you did it all at once, it would break. But if you just do it a little bit at a time, mm -hmm. it goes back into place nicely. So well, he put beams and posts to hold it in place. And okay. So I, th I think you've answered my next question. Uh, I am, every time I go there, I'm fascinated by looking up into the silos and seeing that diagonal slats. Isn't that, that a work of the, art? The, yes. Now, is that the best way to build that turret roof, or is that because you wanted or they wanted to replicate what was there? That was the 1918 way. Okay. The um, contractor said, do you want to do silos the way they do them now, which would be to wrap uh, plywood around it. And I said, no, let's do it the way it was done originally. And I remember talking to one of the workers out there, and he said when he went up there, he said, those slats up there that you could see were so rotten, he said, if you touched them, they would fall. <laughs> we have a video of them taking one of them down and just yeah, fell down. Yeah, I remember in. that. Was... So they photographed it to get what they could and then went from there and they did a beautiful job they of, did. of replicating it. Um, do you have any estimate of how many photos you have of the original farms? Of the original farms, I have uh, maybe 12. Just 12? Maybe 12. Mm. I know the Charlotte Historical Well, Society. of the big ones. Yeah, uh, we don't have much more than that ourselves. Oh, okay. Well, people have sent me photos of their um, family member, like, Oakley Saunders family sent me pictures of Oakley Saunders with the horse and Oakley Saunders sitting on the car. And Somebody uh, who works out there told me that you have amassed an enormous documentary history of the farms, that you have just found an enormous amount Every of information. Every time I could find something. <laughs> <laughs> One winter, we were here two winters while we were putting the roof on the big barn, and there's not a lot you can do if you don't like winter sports. So I came down to the library and I was going through the films of the newspapers just page by page looking for Loeb Farms. 
they actually had like a little um, section in the paper sometimes, Loeb Farm Notes, yeah. and they would tell who had a birthday party and <laughs> I mean stuff you would never see in the Charlevoix Courier now. That's right. They 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 documented everything way back then. There wasn't a whole lot going on. <laughs> did you do it? Did you do the majority of the research work yourself, or did you have assistance? That I did. Um, Marsha. Uh, Braun has done a lot of research herself mm -hmm. just because she loves it. <laughs> I know, I work with her. <laughs> she does, she's very good at it. I think there are some articles in the Petoskey paper and I have not started working on that yet. Well, you started in 2001, I think it was in 2003, you had the turrets re-roofed, you had everything cleaned out, you had bare stone walls standing, and that was the year 2003 when I believe you opened it up to the public for them to come out to see the progress you were making. And I think everybody was gobsmacked at what was going on. We had no idea <laughs> it was going to end up like it did. Me well, either. <laughs> <laughs> In 2006, it was pretty well done and you had the big open house that year and you invited the Historical Society to come out to sell our merchandise. And before you opened the gates, you came over to my table and you had this worried look on your face. And you said, David, nobody knows us. Nobody knows what, what we're doing out here. I don't think anybody's going to be coming. I said, Linda, <laughs> I said, you have nothing to worry about. What you are doing for this area is beyond belief. I think you had how many thousands of people show up? It was three times the population of Charlevoix. They came from all over northern Michigan. And you ran out of food. <laughs> and you were walking around afterwards. It was like a light bulb was on inside you. You were so pleased at the response. And talking to the people as they came in. I don't think you had any idea how much this property meant to the people of Northern Michigan. I did not. I didn't realize that almost everybody in town had somebody who either built it or worked at it or had some connection to the property. True. Went to get ice cream cones from a... You know. Yeah, went to the ball games. Now, well, I have been a pretty... Uh, private person. We'd come up here for years and I fly under the radar pretty much. And I said, well, I can keep doing that. And my children just looked at me like, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I would just, you know, do my thing. And <laughs> that's what I happened to be doing. Well, so I'm yeah, I, I was surprised at how um, visible, visible the property is. And how visible I became. <laughs> you certainly did. Now, is the, continue, is the castle a continual work in progress, or do you have a long-term plan for it? We never have a long-term <laughs> plan. <laughs> we, just, we just go one step, and when we get there, we look around like, oh, this would be nice, and we do one step. So the ideas come on the spot, and you go from They there. do. We have never had a <laughs> long-term <laughs> plan. How many weddings are you being uh, hosting we'll now every probably year? probably do 190 this year, maybe. Close to 200. Okay. And that's our goal, is to hit 200. And hit 200. We're getting close. Although, you know, the number that we have now is manageable, very manageable. Good. I know... Uh, I'm just trying to get more tours to come in, more buses, more yeah. day people. That's my real favorite. When I work on Fridays and Saturdays at the Historical Society, people will come in and they say, well, we're here for the, for the weekend for a wedding. And I say, I bet you you're out of Castle Farms. And they all say yes. <laughs> well, oh, that's the, great. I didn't know they went to, yeah. to you. So what other types of, uh, of events do you host out there? We do fundraisers. We host the big um, hospital fundraiser called Holly Days. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually in November, early December. And they make quite a lot of money for the hospital. Concerts? Concerts. Uh, the Great Lake Chamber Orchestra comes out sometimes. Mm -hmm. We don't do rock concerts, we do Bach concerts. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Bach concert people don't tear the place up and leave trash all over. <laughs> yes, well, we, we like them. <laughs> Conventions? Yes, I think um, the Charlevoix uh, community does uh, a convention for uh, businesses once a year. I forget what it's called. Um, and so they can interact and uh, see who else is here. And I suppose people who want to come to the area can, can meet with who's here and who could they work with and who could they network with. They do that. Uh, St. Mary's School does a fundraiser. Um, the Montessori School does a, a fright night, which is a costume party just for the grown-ups. <laughs> and they have a real good time. <laughs> Leave the kids home. <laughs> and your, your tour bus uh, touring and luncheon business is increasing, I believe, exponentially each year. They're getting it more is. and more. If they want, they, we, we can cater a lunch mm -hmm. out there for them. And if your experience is close to ours, which I'm sure it is because we share, they come then and they do the early young houses uh, here in town. Um, many that we have noticed of these buses are coming from across the country now. Oh, they are. We've yes. had them come. Um, well, we've had groups come from as far as California. Sometimes yeah. they fly to Detroit or or Chicago, or Chicago right. and then drive up mm -hmm. and around. Well, the last six tours I have done have all been out of state. So we're just we're just amazing. It's the Pure Michigan campaign that's bringing people think here. So. We even had a group from China, and they <laughs> said, well, we don't have any of our tour guides here. Will you do the guided tour? And I thought, I don't speak Chinese. <laughs> but they had their own interpreter, and he did his best to follow my jokes. <laughs> I like to put jokes in. Yeah, last year we had a group from Germany oh. that made it a special point to drive up here to see the Earl Young houses. Oh, uh, it was just amazing. Yes, humble. Earl Young is getting to be known. Yes, definitely. He was the most well, hidden people visited, artist. People have visited here from all over the world, and I think one of your managers told me that you are now over the 50,000 per year, 50,000 visitors per year. Between wedding guests and tours, yes. Right. Which is not, I think, going to be going down. Do you have any idea of some of the more exotic places that people have originated from who have come to the castle? You had a map out there of the world, and people would have pin a pin in it. And I saw a couple of pins from the middle of Siberia. <laughs> <laughs> that might have been a joke. <laughs> I don't know. Uh... But have, you, have anybody ever said to you, I am from, and you were uh, amazed? Well, the Chinese, of course. <laughs> yeah. Well, people come from Australia and um, South Africa. We had some. We had a wedding of some people from South Africa. Really? I believe they went to the University of Michigan and decided they wanted to have a wedding here, mm -hmm. and they had driven up from Ann Arbor and. Uh, probably most of their friends were here and they brought family from South Africa. Okay. That was pretty interesting. Do you get... Uh, oh, Ireland. We even had somebody come from Ireland to have a wedding at our castle when they have their own. <laughs> like, hey. Uh, what does that tell you? Yeah. Uh, do you get communications back from people after they get back home from overseas telling you how much they appreciate the castle? I do. Once in a while, people send me pictures. Or I had one um, person who was visiting. Um, I think they were from, it was from Scandinavia. I forget which country. And he said, oh, we have a mug at our house of, the, of our monarch. Would you like it? And so he sent me a, a cup of the queen. For I, the display. For the display. Wonderful. That was really nice. <clears throat> what are some of the off-the-wall questions that people ask that sort of make you wonder, where is this coming from? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, there's just always the usual ones, like, um, why did you do this? 
Like I ask myself that <laughs> many times a day. But <laughs> no, um, unusual questions. Mm, sometimes they'll they'll run into Richard at the trains and they'll say. Um, where did she get her money? And he says, from her first husband, which is him. <laughs> and they look like, whoa, and you married her. <laughs> and we're, we're just the comedy team. <laughs> Do you still get a lot of inquiries about the rock and roll years from the 70s into the 90s? Once in a while we do. Um, not too many uh, inquiries from the mail, but a lot of people come and they enjoy our hallway that has pictures and uh, ticket stubs. Um, I've got a few t-shirts that show Charlevoix as part of their tour. Okay. Um, I just keep looking for stuff, posters, you know, that they used. Um, every so often they come up on eBay and we find them. And I know, that's, that's one hallway I take all my visitors out to. <laughs> <clears throat> Did you, was there ever a time during the restoration years that you and Richard looked at each other and said, my God, what are we doing? Have we bitten off more than Oh, we often, shoot? often. <laughs> well, first we say, how hard could this be? That's one of our family mottos. And then we say, whatever made us think we could do this? And then after about a minute, you just go back to work and do it. <laughs> Have you succeeded beyond your wildest dreams? Oh, absolutely. It's not cash flowing yet. That would have really been nice. But we're getting close. We're not having to put as much into it each year. Mm -hmm. And I think as our tours grow, that should get better. Good, good. Now, I've been out there, and I have watched you work the crowd. And your interaction with people, you will talk to anybody. Of course. Yes. And you seem to take so much delight in the delight that they are taking in what you have done that I have heard you express your appreciation to them for their reaction. <laughs> I am just so grateful for anybody who will come and see us. You know, I, I always am amazed that people would go to so much effort to come and see the castle. But I'm, I'm a person of faith, and I feel that I can show God's love to people by giving them personal attention, looking right at them, you know, that I see you as a person. You're not just a number wandering around. You're a real person. And I, that's how I try to show God's love to people, by inviting them, being grateful. Well, when people ask you at the Historical Society, who, who are the people who did this castle? And I say to them, if you saw Linda Mueller on the street, <laughs> you would never <laughs> recognize this sweet lady having a spine of steel and determination that is going to do this no matter what, and look what she has done. So you're certainly not a hands-off owner. Now, what kind of awards and recognitions for historic preservation has the castle received? Well, I did actually work with the a Michigan Historic Preservation Society, or office, SHPO, out of Lansing, and we met with um, the fellow who's in charge of it, and I had all his instructions, and I did it right to the letter. In fact, I would keep calling him up and saying, is it okay if I do this? Is it okay if I do that? And he was kind of overwhelmed with other projects. And finally he said, Linda, I don't think there is anything you would do that wouldn't be perfectly <laughs> acceptable. So I filled out 50 pages of well, it was a big property. I had to take each room and tell what its condition was and what I intended to do about it. And then I took 150 pictures of before. And then I went back around and did 150 pictures after. This is what we did so that they could see we did it the way we said we were going to. So he at the end said that was the most complete application he had ever received. But I'm always afraid that 
I won't do something good enough, so I always put every ounce of effort I have into it. Is it listed on either the state or the national? It is, both. Both. That was done by uh, the Friends of 4-H who had tried to buy the property oh, that's right. uh, before. <coughs> they were trying to buy it on land contract from ART. And if with land contracts, if you don't make a payment, it goes back to the owner and they keep all the money. Like, what were they thinking? But <laughs> I had actually sent some money to them uh, to try to help build the property. But it was... I know, it was a major disappointment when they had to give it up. Yes, to a lot of people. They were hoping to save it. But hopefully I've done everything that they wanted and, well, um, and more. Uh, well, okay. the, the scouts come out sometimes and have projects out there and... Um, I don't think we've done a lot with 4-H. I do um, sponsor children from time to time to raise animals, sheep or pigs or something. Really, really so, hands on, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, wanting to be involved with kids and farming and that sort of thing. Now I'm gonna put you on the spot here. You don't have to answer if you don't want to, but the 100th anniversary of the laying of the foundation stone out there, which is actually up in a wall uh, near the uh, courtyard of the cow barn, and it says 1908 on it. No, 1918. Or 1918, I'm sorry. So you've got a 100th anniversary coming up. We do. Any plans? We've been talking about it for five years, okay. <laughs> and now it's almost on us. <laughs> so we better get uh, thinking. I think we're going to do small things all summer rather than one great big thing. Mm -hmm. um, the idea was maybe to do one thing for the Loeb farm and something for um, the Mr. Van Haver years. And then if we do a concert, it won't be a big one. <laughs> it would be something on a smaller scale. Uh -huh. and, and just all summer, just have projects going on so that uh, people who come in the summer will have a chance. If you just do one big thing, then it's just who's there at the time. Now, when Lowe Farms opened, did it just open quietly or did they have a big opening ceremony? Do you have any You know, I don't know. My guess is that they just started farming. Uh, I don't think there was any big... Okay. Because they just have I, a little stand. There was nothing in the newspapers, so I think there would have been if they had done something. Okay. But they actually started farming before the buildings were completed mm -hmm. to plant fields and, and that sort of thing. Okay. Well, I've got one last question. Uh, what do you see the castle being and doing 50 years from now? 50 years from now. Well, see, I'm 67. <laughs> I don't expect to have to put a new roof on the building. I think it should last my lifetime. <laughs> Are any members of your family expressing interest in... Well, one of my sons and his wife help with the website, <clears throat> and they do consulting with us. These two went to Florida State, so they know fun when they see it. <laughs> and Carrie, my daughter-in-law, was a Disney princess. Uh, she was Cinderella for about five or six years. Really? Yeah. Uh -huh. So they're, of course, all about castles and princesses. And I think if it cash flowed, they would be interested. None of the kids want to put money in it, which I think was the same problem with the Loeb family. Um, when Albert owned the property, he could use Sears money to uh, get the farm up and running. And if it made a profit, it was only for a year or so. And none of the boys wanted to continue it. Um, farming's hard work. <laughs> it's like 24 seven right. with the animals. And so um, I think they probably would want to put it into a 501c3, a nonprofit, and have a, a community uh, board who would work with it. 
and keep it going that way. Well, it's such an asset to Northern Michigan, we simply do not ever want to lose it like we almost did before. And, <laughs> and after what you have done, is just, it's, just, it's just unbelievable. It's indescribable. So, Linda, thank you so much for sharing oh, your time with welcome. us. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, long may Castle Farm stand. Thank you. You're welcome.